I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. And this is Currents. Sunday, Advent and Lent, and what it all means. These are very important days for Christians. We celebrate them each year, and it's a cycle of beginning and end. After 85 years, this Queen's School is still going strong. Many schools have closed, and we want to ensure that Immaculate Conception School stays here in the heart of Astoria. And after more than 40 years, people are still wondering what happened at Vatican II. A new book looks for answers. I do not like that expression that Vatican II was out to modernize the church. Right. Certainly there was a, an element of that, but that was 10%, 5%. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us this Thursday. Well, Thanksgiving, can you believe it? It is only a week away. It seems like summer was just here, but stores have even had their Christmas displays up for weeks. It's oh. kind of true. Where did the year go? I don't know. But in all the excitement of looking for gifts and preparing meals, the meanings behind Christmas, Advent, and other religious seasons really get lost. They can be. There's plenty of opportunity, though, to get reacquainted with those meanings. St. John's University hosts Three Things Talks, in which three church topics are discussed. We sent our cameras to this past weekend's talk on Advent, Lent, and Sunday. Sunday is really the, you might say, key holy day in the liturgical year. I mean, sometimes some people will refer to it as the weekly Easter. I would want to nuance that a little bit because it's more than just the weekly Easter, it's also the weekly Pentecost. And of course, there are a number of other themes that are important to every Sunday that perhaps Sunday has probably gotten lost in this notion of the weekend. And as a result, perhaps we've lost some real sense for the sacredness of Sunday as a day on its own. And then part of that also has to do with maybe an overly at times relaxed approach to celebrating the Eucharist among Catholics especially. Well, I think Advent is a season, okay, in preparation for Christmas. Um, we have to be careful not to lose Advent because we go right into Christmas. Christmas there's no problem with because everyone celebrates Christmas. The other seasons are important, especially for Christians, the season of Lent, 40 days of prayer fasting. Easter is the season in which we celebrate uh, Jesus rising from the dead. So these are very important days for Christians. We celebrate them each year and there's a cycle of beginning and end. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, out. Everything we do here would be pointless. People know that intellectually, but they don't celebrate that in their lives. And we think of it as a moment, as someone said here today, because we're just, you know, we're a fast paced society. We think Easter is a moment. He rose, okay, on with the next thing. But actually, He is risen. He is risen. He is among us when we gather together. The seasons of the year are just are used and they become, they become part of the ordinary culture. They become much more secularized. So Christmas has become secularized. Easter has become secularized to a certain extent. It's not that it's a bad thing that the, that the whole society knows that Christmas is coming and Easter is coming, but the religious values which undergird Christmas and Easter, sometimes they don't get the kind of attention that they need to. Four times during the course of the year, twice in a semester, we run three of these talks around a particular theme. So for example, we had a talk last May, three talks on Mary. And then earlier this semester, we had three talk talks on priesthood for the year for the priests. And the three talks today were all around liturgical year. I think it's very inspiring and very factual. Uh, he, he's, he talks in a, a, a language that everybody understands. And it's a very interesting topic, liturgical year. And it's something that you live with on Sunday to know what it's all about. And it's very spiritual. And I, I, I feel that he, uh, the way he presents it and the whole program is very beneficial and I, I'm very glad I came. I think they are actual topic that interests all Catholics. The, like I said, is a continuing education for me. I came today, you know, to deepen my knowledge, to know better the faith, live it and be able to spread it. The liturgical season is our liturgical life, okay? There are five seasons, Advent, Christmas, um, Lent, Easter, Ordinary Time, and we celebrate the Paschal Mystery. Each season celebrates something about Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection. For example, Advent celebrates uh, the coming of God born in history. Christmas celebrates the birth of Christ. 
So each of the seasons is connected somehow uh, to uh, who Jesus is for us. Jesus is born at Christmas as our Savior and Messiah. They had such beautiful mosaics and things there. It was very, very nice unique, to look at. Yeah, unique artwork. It was nice. It was very cool. But yeah, the, the, you know, the point of all this, of course, is uh, you know keeping the uh, the liturgical seasons, uh, you know, kind of figuring those out in your mind. Mm -hmm. I know from growing up in a, in a Protestant household uh, and uh, in a Protestant church, we didn't really keep track of it. I mean, I guess another way of looking that is uh, looking at it is that it was always ordinary time. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we would observe the holidays. Christmas, Easter, that sort of thing, but really as far as the seasons like uh, Advent and Lent and things like that, those weren't really a big part of, uh, of our life um, growing up. So it was, uh, it's very neat to, for me to see the very powerful uh, meaning and, and, and the great meaning behind each of these different seasons of the church year. Yeah, there are different meanings and things that you can do to keep them a little bit more alive in your life. I know when I was growing up, my grandfather, who was in the Knights of Columbus and would always go to church and all those things, you know, for Lent, he would always give up red wine, which for him was a big deal because he used to love his <laughs> Carlo Rossi at night and whatever when he would get out of work, but um, or alcohol in general. I mean, he would just give that up. And, uh, you know, he would always, he would also always rest on Sundays, which right. was a big deal because he worked two jobs five, six days a week mm -hmm. and he had five kids and a wife and you know he would always rest go to church rest and then he'd visit people right. uh, you know so those were some of the smaller things that he did to keep the seasons in mind in his uh, daily life right. more so than just you know it's Christmas time let's buy some presents yeah. well good work there <laughs> well stay tuned there's much more currents coming up straight ahead well how Catholic are Catholic colleges US bishops will look for answers Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up just a bit later on, a school in Queens looks back on 85 years. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. There is more information coming out about some special bishops committees designed to look into just how Catholic different institutions are. One of the things the bishops will examine is what kind of authority they have over Catholic colleges and universities. The issue gained national attention earlier in the year when Notre Dame president, or university rather, honored President Obama, who supports abortion rights. <clears throat> Elsewhere, the role of Catholic higher education is not only being examined here in the U.S. As we hear from H2O News, talks are also happening in Rome. On Monday, November 16th, Professor Philippe Capel Dumont opened the work sessions of the International Federation of Catholic Universities 23rd General Assembly. After his keynote address on the Catholic University and Postmodern Societies, Challenges and Promises, Professor Capel Dumont, Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Philosophy of the Catholic Institute of Paris, was awarded the Ex Corde Ecclesiae Medal that the Federation has granted to leading academics since 2004. It is a medal that carries an admirable name, Ex Corde Ecclesiae, from the heart of the church. I accepted it as a gift. In fact, all my academic and priestly life has come from the heart of the church and serves the heart of the church. Perhaps we do not sufficiently acknowledge that the church is also a source of great intellectual inspiration for thousands and millions of academics, and that faith as such generates thought, to use Gabriel Marcel's expression, Thought has not been exiled from the Catholic University. It is present and is in some way inspired by what the church is in her reviving principle, in her creative principle. Father Capel Dumont, who said that receiving this medal encourages him in his efforts, recalled that Catholic universities and their professors have a very specific role to play in postmodern societies. I believe their role is to point out that difference is not the same thing as fragmentation. It requires a principle of differentiation, hence a principle of acknowledgement. It is necessary for men to acknowledge one another today and tomorrow, and to not live in fragmentation. Therefore, we have to work so that we are capable of acknowledging one another. The International Federation of Catholic Universities meets through tomorrow. Washington's Archbishop says the church is not making any threats. Archbishop Donald Worrell says the Washington Archdiocese would be forced to cut services if the District of Columbia City Council votes to legalize gay marriage. In a Washington Post column earlier this week, Worrell says that's not a threat, 
but recognition of the policy's consequences. A group of conservative Lutherans says it is splitting with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America over the denomination's recent decision allowing non-celibate gay clergy to serve openly in its churches. Leaders from the group called Lutheran Corps just said yesterday that they hope to have their new denomination off the ground by next August. The ELCA voted to allow gay pastors who are sexually active to serve as clergy at its convention in August. Lutheran Corps says that move is contradictory to scripture. Well, freedom finally for two women in Iran who had converted to Christianity. The women, ages 27 and 30, had been in prison since March and charged with activities against the state. They were reportedly pressured to renounce their Christian faith and return to Islam. A new, ju a new judge rather acquitted them and let them return home, but they could be facing more court hearings in the future. An Episcopal pastor on Staten Island has been sentenced to five years probation for using church money to pay for plastic surgery. Reports say Reverend William Blazingame must also pay back the more than $80,000 he took from St. Paul's Memorial Episcopal Church. The money was used to pay for personal luxuries, he says, including Botox treatments and plastic surgery procedures. The money was supposed to go to the needy and toward upkeep of the church grounds. The pastor's lawyer says Reverend Blazingame is very sorry. Can't believe that one. I know, it's just a little bit crazy. Yeah, it is. Stay tuned, there's much more current straight ahead. Coming up, it changed the church forever. We'll look at the groundbreaking gathering of Vatican II. Instead of trying to treat members of other religions as enemies, uh, to try to see if there's any common ground there. Welcome back to Currents. It happened more than 40 years ago, but people are still talking about the Second Vatican Council. The meetings that took place there led to significant changes in the church, but they've also brought about a lot of debate. Well, joining me now is an author trying to get to the bottom of it all. Father John O'Malley is a theology professor at Georgetown University. His book is called, What Happened at Vatican II? Father O'Malley, thank you so much for joining us today. A pleasure to be here. So I, I can't think of any other way to start off the interview than by asking you, what really happened at Vatican II? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the question everybody wants to have answered, and I took many pages to try to answer it in the course of the book. A number of things happened of extreme importance, the uh, particular things such as the uh, validation of separation of church and state and freedom of conscience, uh, the uh, more uh, friendly approach to other religions, especially the Muslims and uh, uh, Judaism, Israel, and so forth. So those are particular things that happened. But uh, for me, the uh, most interesting thing about the Second Vatican Council is unlike other councils, it, uh, you have to look at it as a totality. Yeah. Because uh, the other councils are basically sort of collections of different uh, 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 regulations and uh, standards for uh, different things, so very short canons, really, really short ordinances, right. whereas Vatican II is, you have to look at it as a, as a totality. So what really happened there? I think that one important thing that happened was uh, it taught a certain style of being Catholic and being church, which was a kind of a modification of earlier held values and priorities. Right. So instead of trying to treat members of other religions as enemies, mm -hmm. uh, to try to see if there's any common ground there and uh, to see how we can work together in this very uh, uh, difficult world in right. which we live. There's very, a lot of hostility in the world. Yeah. So to try to overcome that. So that's one of the big things that happened, it seemed to me. Right. But you have to read the book to find out uh, you know what happened there. Yeah, of course, of <laughs> course. <laughs> um, well, there's a beginning of a lot of a lot of ecumenical dialogue uh, there, of course, and also I um, I think uh, a lot of what happened at Vatican II, from my understanding, was um, kind of taking a different look at uh, church teaching in a lot of ways and saying, well, uh, we're not going to focus so much on. Um, what we're against as to what we're for, that, that kind of, to put it in layman's terms. That you put it better thing. than I did. So, 
<laughs> no, that's precisely it. And I think, for instance, on the whole ecumenical thing, I mean, we sort of take that for granted today, but when I was growing up, for instance, it was forbidden for a Catholic to go to a Protestant, to a wedding or a funeral in a Protestant church. I mean, that's kind of almost inconceivable today. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's just one of the sort of changes. So, uh, again, as I say, a change in priority, a change in certain, certain values, modification of certain values. So right. That was okay. Well, there's, and, and they're <coughs> kind of really, uh, I guess, two schools of thought on, on, on Vatican II. There's maybe the, the more uh, conservative viewpoint on it as to, well, it did away with, you know, 2,000 years of, of uh, you know, church teaching and that, that sort of thing. And then there's the, maybe a, a, on the other side of, well, it was a great thing that really sort of modernized the church. Where do you fall along that spectrum? I fall on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the th I do not like that expression, the Vatican II was out to modernize the church. Right. Certainly there was a, an element of that in what, what Vatican II tried to do. But that was 10%, 5%. Right. More basically, <clears throat> what the council tried to do was to go back into the tradition and to get a deeper look at the tradition and to use these insights as in order to help us sort of deal with the present. To give you an example, the, uh, the teaching on religious liberty, so separation of church and state. For Americans today, that sounds, yeah, well, yawn, you know, of right. course, that's, that's right. But in the council, it was a hot issue. It almost didn't. They certainly thought it was not going to make it. And here was one problem that popes in the 19th century had repeatedly condemned separation of church and state mm -hmm. and freedom of conscience. Well, how do you deal with that? Right. Well, the way the council dealt with it was to go back deeper in the tradition and uh, to say, well, first of all, the act of faith to be genuine must always be free. And then to the basic teaching that the ultimate norm for one's personal uh, moral decisions is conscience. Right. You cannot act against your conscience, even if it's an erroneous conscience. So that's going. So the council was not so much to modernize as to really go back and bring up things from the past that will help us today. Right. Okay. Well, very good. Now, um, the sales of the book, I understand, have been going rather well. You can. Uh, it's now. I, I believe you said in its sixth hardcover printing. It's in its sixth hardcover printing. So the publisher's delighted. And so am I. So. <laughs> well, very good. <laughs> and it's coming out in, there'll be a paperback in March, and then the Italian translation in, uh, and also in March. I'm going to Italy for that, as a matter of fact, and then a Polish translation's on the way. So okay. it's doing well. Well, so. very good. My, uh, my object in writing it was, uh, I mean, there's so much talk about Vatican II by people, and it's so massive ignorance. A lot of the thought about Vatican II is anecdotal. My grandmother told me, or something like right. this. And so I wanted to write what I call a basic book. Uh, if you've heard about Vatican II, I say, I've heard about Vatican II, and I say, here's your book. Yeah. Uh, this will give you the basics you need to sort of put it in context, and you can go from there after that. Okay, so. well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Father O'Malley, for being here today. We really thank appreciate you. your time, and uh, we'll uh, kind of blog a little bit more about your book on our uh, website and uh, give people some more information. Good. Very good. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up straight ahead. Coming up, a school in Queens looks back to when it all began. I went to the school in 1925. The parish is 85 years old. Really have benefited by my Catholic education. Well, finally, this past weekend, a school in Queens celebrated its 85th anniversary. Immaculate Conception School, as well as the parish, was founded in 1924, and it's been an institution in Astoria ever since. Students and teachers from throughout the school's history came to this celebration. And if this latest gathering is any indication, it shows no sign of slowing down. Today, we're celebrating the 85th anniversary of Immaculate Conception School. Uh, we started with a mass at 5 o'clock where the honorees received awards for their service to the school and to the community. We have five tremendous uh, honorees that uh, we're very uh, happy to be able to honor. Two teachers, uh, Tina Vallone, uh, who had taught uh, for a number of years in our school, and also Liz Willicki who uh, was a teacher for almost 50 years in our school. Rosemary Prager, 
uh, graduated a, a number of years ago. She's still active at 81 in our parish. Joe Rocco is the provincial of the Sacred Heart Brothers, and uh, where he's a graduate of our school. And finally, Jean Sullivan, who's 89 years old, and uh, was from the first graduating class of the school. I was honored tonight because of the fact that I went to the school in 1925. The parish is 85 years old, so that was about 85 years ago. Really have benefited by my Catholic education. It taught me principles and ethics, which are very important in today's life. And I'm now 89 years of age, and uh, I've lived a good life because of my education. Our theme for tonight is celebrating the past, securing the future. We wanted to celebrate those who went before to make Catholic education so important. Many schools have closed, and we want to ensure that Immaculate Conception School stays here in the heart of Astoria, uh, providing a good Catholic education to our children. We have uh, about 262 students, pretty much evenly divided between boys and girls. We go from nursery to eighth grade. I have two children at uh, Immaculate Conception, Gina and um, Emily. It's a wonderful school. The, ch the children are known by their first names and the teachers are very friendly. The principal is very nice and they do a wonderful job at Immaculate Conception. The biggest challenge of Catholic education today is keeping the schools open. Um, public schools have come up, uh, they're doing a good job, and charter schools are becoming very popular here in New York City. But what separates us from the pack is that we provide a faith-based values education um, in addition to providing a safe and nurturing environment. Yeah, the biggest challenge is out of tuition. The tuitions are getting a little high and some people can't afford them in the public schools offer, offer you to go for free but you know you have the Catholic, you've got the Catholic background you, if you're Catholic you should go to Catholic school. The biggest challenge of Catholic education I think is to uh, truly teach the Catholic faith and to pass that on to this generation in this world at this time. So I think uh, we're, uh, we're up to the challenge and I think it will be a very wonderful experience for the next 85 years. She's so cute. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, the, the gentleman in the story there brought up a good point uh, about tuition. I mean, you know, it, it, that is, especially right now when the economic conditions aren't the best, let's right. say, um, it can be a challenge. It can be, but I think a lot of people will make those sacrifices and find a way to try right. and get their kids into a good school because they feel as though, for better or for worse, some of the public school options are not as good, and they also obviously don't have the faith element that's there, which is a kind of a foundation that a lot of people just say, it's it's worth those sacrifices, whatever we have to do. Right, and, and like you say, somebody, th they'll find a way. If they really want to do it, they can find a way to do it, and, uh, you know, I'm sure help is out there. There are scholarships. Remember, we did the Great Irish Fair, right. and you know that. Right. Uh, they did provide the scholarships for for uh, several different uh, students and things like that on a yearly basis. So yeah, yeah, there is help out there. So you know, I mean, if they if they want to find a way, they can. Yeah, <laughs> 85 years and going strong. That's right. Well, that is all for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow, there's more than one vocation in the church. We'll check out an information night for men interested in becoming deacons. I know one. Hey, I know one too. <laughs> Imagine that. If you want to know who it is, check the credits at the end of the show. That's right. Until then, you can always catch us online. Just head on over to CurrentsNY.net. And you can also follow us on Facebook. We're up to 856 fans or something like that. Just Growing go to strong. Yeah, Facebook.com <laughs> slash CurrentsNY. And that's just in a couple of months. So uh, for all of us here at Currents, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.